today I'm going to give you an introduction to federated authentication. Uh, my name is Matt Randall. Uh, we're a certain for the bio here in a second. Um, I kind of speed this up because I know between you guys and beer. <laughs> we brought beer, so we're going to Oh, yeah, well, I brought beer. Great. Hopefully, it'll make you the questions more yeah, interesting. Yeah, we're here to see you. Do not rush. Do your presentation. Okay. We're here to see you. Yeah. All right. So, let's say. You're a developer, you've just built your brand new SaaS offering to help businesses connect with their customers, and you've gone through all this work, you've built all the necessary account management tools for these orgs to create their users, both their employees and their consumers. And so maybe you've gone about implementing that using Google Firebase or Amazon Cognito or Azure AD or Meteor, one of these frameworks that does all the thinking for you for how you store passwords and create users. And maybe even you've gone to the length of Using password off this, or like, excuse me, passwordless authentication like WebAuthn or FIDO, um, where you're using most modern standards. So you, you feel really confident in your security posture and your account management story. And so you're, you sit down with your first big enterprise customer and you're explaining to them your authentication features. And those are great features, they say. They, so they know you understand your stuff. Uh, but we have our own authentication system for our users or customers. Uh, how do we plug our authentication system in, they ask you. So you're sitting across the table and then uh, you're like, uh, then comes the F word? <laughs> federation, that's right. <laughs> Did you think I was talking about a different F word? All right, so today I'm talking about what is identity federation, how is it used, how does it work, and what challenges will I encounter in implementing it or using it if I'm an enterprise. A bit about me, uh, I'm a distinguished engineer here at Cerner Corporation. I started writing software at very early age, at the age of eight. Uh, my brother's on a computer store in St. Louis, and so I first the language was basic. It was, uh, my dad had actually been <coughs> from the H89 ported the Atari ST. Started working here at Cerner, did a lot of enterprise stuff, Google, PeopleSoft, Omnifine, SharePoint. Um, part of my work in integrating enterprise systems was integrating authentication, so I started learning about all of how authentication systems integrate uh, early in my career. And as I built that experience, um, I found that we were lacking it in our own commercial offerings that we offer the clients. And so I became a principal engineer over in our development side for our own commercial solutions. So what is federation? So here's a giant definition of federation from OASIS, which is kind of the standards group that created the standard around this process. Um, so referring to establishment of business agreements, cryptographic trust, user identifiers or attributes across security and policy domains, to enable more seamless cross domain business interactions. Wow, let's kind of break this down to something a little bit more digestible. So the big thing that they're trying to do with these protocols is essentially make it very seamless in the way that you do business between two parties. So take an example, Office 365. Anyone here use Office 365 in their organization? Yeah. So Office 365 is in, in the language a service provider. They're offering a service to you, but they don't necessarily want to be the one that are authenticating their users. So in this model, they delegate this to your identity provider. Um, so as you go through the login process, they'll send you to an identity provider and they're making this seamless across the organizations. They don't authenticate your users, you authenticate them, um, and your identity <coughs> provider ultimately logs your user in. So this linkage, this cross-organizational linkage is known as a federation. And so Office 365 obviously has many of these federations, one between Example Corp and another between Generic Corp. And so each one of these individual uh, entities is a federation in itself. And of course, you might use multiple service providers at your organization. And so as you can tell, this becomes a many-to-many -many relationship, that there's individual federations between each organization and respective service providers that they use. So as part of this, obviously, there's a business agreement. You're, you're, you're uh, buying stuff from Office 365, from Microsoft. And so you set up a business or agreement that they're going to use your identity provider in order authenticate users. Um, part of this then is, as part of this process for exchanging information, the big thing that we're interested in is user identifiers. Who's actually logged in here? Uh, can we get some agreement as to who it is that's, that's authenticated and potentially some attributes about them? So in the Office 365 example, again, if you've ever logged into Office 365, you'll note that the first thing that they have you do is you type in a user principal name, like Alice at example court. Um, that's what actually maps back to the identity provider. So you get to go to your identity provider, you log in as Alice. It's when Alice is being logged into Office 365, the example corp is sending Alice at example.corp as the identifier. 
but that might not be the same identifier that Workday uses to identify users. So example, Corp's federated relationship with Workday might be that they're mapping just an employee identifier, like employee 5147. Um, it might not even be user identifiers that you care about. Anyone use video on demand services? Like HBO, their cable provider? If you've ever gone through that process, you go to HBO Video On Demand, it says, hey, log <coughs> in to a cable provider. You pick Comcast Xfinity, you log in. It cares about that you're a paid HBO subscriber, Comcast Xfinity does. It probably doesn't really care about what your user identifier is. Um, if you ever used a social networking site, like House, I'm big into home decor. Home decor, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you log in to a site that uses social networking, obviously that's a federated relationship as well. Um, they care about who you are in Facebook, et cetera, so they can market and send ads to you uh, for uh, suede curtains and things. Um, and finally, uh, cryptographic trust. So establishment of cryptographic trust, a lot of the, these protocols are built on top of cryptography. Most of these federation protocols have a concept of what's called metadata. And so this is data that describes the identity provider, its endpoints, and public keys that are used in order to facilitate uh, protocol interactions. So these get exchanged in different ways. One of the ways is that an administrator can just manually exchange this. So Office 365 gives you their information in a file, you go to administrative tooling in your identity provider, and you import that information, either by picking out bits by hand, or getting the file directly, et cetera, and so forth. Most times it's are XML. In the case of OpenID, it's JSON. Another way it can be done is through PKI, in which you bootstrap your trust relationship between each other via HTTPS URLs and use the Internet's PKI system in order to trust one another's endpoints. So in this case, the service provider just reaches out to the identity provider to fetch the metadata and vice versa. Uh, this is very useful because if like, you want to rotate public-private keys at a cadence, um, something that Active Directory Federation Services does automatically on a yearly basis, Having the ability for your systems to just automatically exchange and bootstrap trust off of the Internet Web of Trust is, is a very useful thing to have. Um, and then finally, um, I talked earlier about, you know, there's this many-to-many -many relationship between service providers and their subscribers. Um, there's also a different model that exists in Federation uh, for doing this kind of arrangement of business agreement and cryptographic trust. Um, so let's say, for example, you're like a university or a research institute. And you want to be able to allow all other universities or research institutes to be able to access you, authenticate your resources. Um, there's a, actually an institution called INCOM, which does this, which is essentially that it is an aggregate that's a non-for-profit. Um, all the different universities like KSU and ISU join in common. They give their metadata to in common and have a business relationship with in common. And then all the participants federate with in common in order to allow everybody in the the federation to interoperate. And so this eliminates having to have all these individual point-to-point -point federations with all the various parties. Like every university doesn't have to have a point-to-point -point federation with another every university. You simply just join one large pool that aggregates it for everyone in the federation. So how does it work behind the scenes? Um, these are the standards that exist out there in the wild. Uh, the most prevalent is the SAML 2.0 web browser SSO profile. Um, OpenID Connect is a pretty popular one. Uh, that was built in the last couple of years. Most of the bigger social networks implemented except Facebook. Uh, and then some of the older ones, OpenID 2.0, replaced by OpenID Connect. Liberty IDFF, uh, this is what a lot of your travel industry used for a very long time to facilitate single sign-on between travel sites like Travelocity and, and your airlines, and, uh, et cetera. And then uh, WS Federation, Really big at Microsoft land and IBM land. Anyone still using any WS Federation in here? Ever heard of it? Yeah. So, um, so most of these protocols rely on mechanics uh, in your user agents. These are browser-based protocols, um, and so they rely on the ability to do URI redirection or HTTP form posts to another site. So you begin by going to the service, say like Office 365. Office 365 will redirect you or perform an HTTP post to your identity provider. Your IDP interacts with you. And then finally, the IDP sends a URI redirection or post response back to the service provider. And this is a way in which messages, messages exchange in your browser so that it can know that you are a person sitting at this device. Um, it's not limited to just browsers, though. 
Um, URI redirection is actually possible in most of the modern operating systems, iOS, Android, and Windows. So you can actually do intercommunication of this nature with data apps. So as long as it's URI redirection based, you can facilitate this, these types of protocols between native apps, whether it's the IDP or the service provider. Uh, responses then, the information that's actually exchanged, that's posted back to the service providers, a response that contains a cryptographic signature, a sign with the you know, provider's public key, which is exchanging your metadata. And then sometimes you know, may need direct callbacks um, that are either required or, or optional uh, that you can use in the checking signatures. And then finally, each one of these responses is designed to be replay resistant, so they're time bound and they contain nonce, so that they're not being replayed. Other common features you'll find in these protocols you'll find re authentication, um, you'll find step up authentication, so the ability to convey that I need a particular type of authentication to occur, um, the ability to facilitate a logout, the ability to exchange attributes, is this person a paid HBO subscriber? Uh, and then usually have discovery, which is useful if you want to have kind of a uh, no business relationship federation. So um, I'm going to do challenges. As many as I can fit in with the time remaining, so I'm going to also leave some time for questions here at the end. Um, there's quite a few challenges you're going to run into along the way. Um, these protocols, anyone know what this is? Everybody? So these protocols, this, if you're not familiar with this, this is, uh, this is the Homer. So Homer Simpson gets a job in a car manufacturer and basically designs a car with all the possible bells and whistles that you could ever possibly think of. And of course, it's a spectacular failure. Uh, no one really wants a car like this. Uh, but so, anyway. but uh, these are what these protocols are like. Uh, the SAML 2.0 web browser SSO profile um, is, and all of its related specs clocks in at about 300 pages. That's not including XML digital signature. That's a prerequisite. Um, and essentially, they, they try to accommodate every possible use case that one could imagine. Um, but in doing so, they make it extremely difficult for somebody that's just trying to do to, some basic integration, like I, I just I want to make a website that uses your website to log in. They give you way too many options, um, and so everything becomes like this custom consulting engagement. Uh, and everybody has a different idea of how it should work, and there's very rarely can do two systems just interoperate, just out of the box. Um, without just heavy amounts of customization. And so there's, there's too many options, there's just too much complexity. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at implementing this, whether you're implementing a service that's going to, to consume this, or whether you're actually uh, being an identity provider, there's a lot of implementation options right, ranging from libraries uh, to commercial service offerings, and even just software to install on-prem. And the big thing that I found personally is the more flexible the solution, the more enterprising it's going to be, if you know what I mean by enterprising, like these large behemoths of software packages where you install a web server and a web application server and a database, and then 17 items later, and you're about 17 hours into the install and you're beating your head against the wall. Um, or you're rolling it yourself. You're, you're literally coding it from scratch uh, in order to have a maximum amount of flexibility. Um, my, my personal recommendation here is this, your expertise is limited. Rely on commercial services to do this, and then if if you really if you find customers that need that flexibility, just be upfront up front with your customer about your integration options. Like, hey, we only do what Amazon is able to do. We only do what Azure AD is capable of doing. Um, because otherwise, you know, you'll have folks that'll come to you that, that basically say, hey, uh, you, you got SAML support, but yeah, you need to be doing it this way. It's completely wrong. You're doing it completely wrong. We have a better idea of how you should be doing this. Um, this is very common. Um, we've done, um, at Cerner, we've done hundreds of SAML integrations, and many times we'll come across this where someone will say, uh, no, we just absolutely got to have it work this particular <coughs> way um, because we think this is how it should work. And it makes it really difficult. Um, if you are Anticipating that someone's going to come to you with a complicated use, use case, um, don't expect an off-the-shelf product to satisfy them all. Um, off-the-shelf products give you a little bit of safety. If someone does come to you and say, hey, we think it should work this way, you, know, you can say, well, this is, this is what Azure AD does. We're limited really to what Azure AD is capable of. Um, but if you're looking to do something very complicated, like re-authentication or step-up authentication, um, an off-the-shelf product is not always going to do that. And um, so you may end up having to get a protocol expert um, that's going to help you roll an implementation, or you may have to rely on some sort of consulting expertise to find how to make an off-the-shelf product kind of enable exactly what you want. 
Um, the biggest thing that we found, uh, me personally, is that good user experience can be extremely challenging when working with federated authentication systems. Uh, many SAML-based IDPs really handle corner cases poorly. Um, one of my first suggestions is, and this might be counterintuitive, but if you're building an app, your login process, do not start at the identity provider. Don't make the first step of redirect into the login of the identity provider system. Um, make that an extra click, um, that you have a page that's presented to the user when they're not authenticated that says, hey, you need to log in with X identity provider. This at least lets folks know that your app is up, and if it's not available, if there's technical problems, you can give them some sort of banner, you can inform them, so that there's, there's some of these dis disconnection between your, what your app is and what the identity provider is, so that the user is aware that these are two separate entities. Um, building on top of this, another thing that might seem counterintuitive, orchestrate the login process in a separate tab or window. Um, one thing that identity providers handle really poorly is browser history. So if you log in with a login form, and then the user wants to use their browser history navigation backwards, um, a lot of identity providers will just throw up an error, um, or they'll push you forward in the browser history, um, or they'll do just something completely nonsensical, um, or they'll present the login form again. They'll, they'll do weird things which kind of make it difficult for your user to use browser's history navigation. Um, on mobile devices like Android, if you're trying to use the Android back button and you back up into an IDP and it blows up on you or pushes you forward, it's, it's really a dissatisfying user experience. So if you can, orchestrate that login in a separate tab or window. Um, then finally, you know, make it evident to the user what your application's session semantics are during the login process. Are they, are they logging in until they explicitly log out? Until they single log out? Um, if they click log out, does it affect other things they're logged into? Different users are going to have different expectations as to how logout works. Um, so, for example, if you use your YouTube account, um, or you have a Google account that you log into YouTube with, when you go to YouTube and you see your, your account options and realize it's your Google account, and you kind of have that expectation that if you click sign out in YouTube, that you're going to sign out across all of Google's properties, that it's a global single logout. Um, but another person, you know, if they log into Howes, through a social network account, just some random website that uses social login, they probably don't have the expectation that if they log out of that, that it's going to cause them to be logged out of their Facebook account. So different folks have different expectations depending on how they perceive things to be related. So depending on what product you're offering and how you expect your customer to integrate it with it, they might, you might have to think through what you, the user is going to expect in terms of the logout process. Um, another thing that we found or I found is session, single sign-on and session timeouts are features that can really be to <coughs> each other. Um, if you have a single sign-on capability, and, but the customer says, hey, I want you to time the user out um, after you know, 10 minutes of an activity, um, it can be an odd because if you're using a single sign-on system where the identity provider has its own session, and if it allows you to be logged in for an hour, it's this weird, it's this weird scenario where your app says, hey, uh, I've logged you out because you're inactive. Click here to log in. You click to log in, and then you just instantly log back in. And you wonder, is the application buggy? Is it insecure? Et cetera, and so forth. Um, there's ways you can get around this. Um, you can design your system to look at when the identity provider authenticated the user. And then you could say, well, that's older than the maximum amount of time that I accept the person to be inactive. So I'm going to just force the user to be authenticated right now. Um, so that way, if they come into your application, it's been a long time since I've logged in, they'll be forced to re-authenticate, but that, again, can kind of uh, be at odds with single sign-on, depending on what their expectations are. Um, and then Windows Integrated Authentication makes this a complete mess, uh, because if you're using ADFS, it'll always tell you that the person just now logged in, even if they logged in like a week ago and have a Kerberos ticket that's been around for a while. So this, this creates a lot of cognitive dissonance, um, and so, this dissonance of you know an application telling you you've been logged out, that you click and then you just sign right back in, um, it can make folks trust the system less, even security professionals, because they're like, well, I'm logged out, but I'm still logged in. What's what's going on? Um, things you could do, you could disallow Windows Integrated Authentication. That's obviously one uh, opt-out way of getting it. Um, you could design your system to allow integrated auth sessions to last longer. Uh, then those that are established in the other auth mechanisms, most of these protocols can convey how the user logged in. Um, or you can just change your user experience. So just instead of telling them, hey, you've been logged out for security, just treat it as a security check. So for example, just say, hey, we need to verify you're still logged in with ExampleCorp. 
click here to proceed. So that way they don't have the expectation that they're actually logged out. That's just, hey, I just have to do the security check and I may or may not have to re-authenticate. Um, so if you're gonna, if your business is gonna use a service provider, consider if your service provider's thought through these concerns and then, you know, kind of verify that they provide a sensible security experience for your users and your use cases. Uh, so to kind of sum up, if you're an enterprise or developer offering SaaS solutions to enterprises, expect Identity Federation to appear on your radar at some point. Businesses want to plug in their own identities many times, uh, unless they're a small business. Um, use pre-built solutions wherever possible uh, to handle your simple use cases. And if you have complex use cases, you're going to have to expect to deal with some sort of enterprise solution or staffing experts to do some custom development for you. Um, and then finally, user experience is super critical. Anticipate corner cases and test your experience with actual users. And make sure your service provider that you choose uh, behaves within their expectations. So, landing it here, spent through that so we have plenty of time for questions. Do you have any questions? So maybe I got a question to the audience. So how many how many folks are uh, use Identity Federation in some way today in their enterprise? Over here. How many folks have really complicated use cases? Do you guys just use it just for basic basic login? Or oh, how many just use it for a very basic use case? Just purely log in, no sign out, no folks that have like need re off and deal with session timeouts and So, any questions? All right. Well, thank you everyone for showing up today, and I hope everyone's enjoyed the conference today. Thank you again.